Welcome everybody to the latest session in our lives of the left. Um, we're very welcome, uh, very happy to have Ed Boba with us, who will be introducing Ted Grant, who was one of the founding members of the Militant and later Socialist Appeal. So um, we've got about 30 to 40 minutes for an introduction and then comrades can indicate if they want to ask questions or make a comment or contribution and we can bring you in and I'm sure Comrade Boba will be happy to answer your questions. So yeah. thank, thank you thank very much. You, um, but perhaps you could just give me a shout every 10 minutes or so, so that I know how the time's going. Yeah. Okay. 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 Well, thank, yeah. thank you. Well, good, good evening, everyone. <clears throat> um, can you all hear me? It's a webinar, so they can't reply at the okay. moment, right. but it, okay. it's all good. <laughs> right. Um, Ted Grant, was born on July the 9th, 1913, in a little town near Johannesburg, which is called Germiston in South Africa. His name was Isaac Blanc. Um, <clears throat> I'll, come, I'll come later to why he changed his name. Ted was, as a, at a very young age, Ted was inspired by the events of the Russian Revolution. In South Africa, he met a comrade called Ralph Lee, who'd been a member of the South African Communist Party, but who got expelled during the Stalinist purges. Um, Ralph stayed in the house which Ted, Ted Grant was living in as a kid because his mother took in lodgers to supplement their income. That gives you a little bit of an idea of the kind of social background Ted came from. It wasn't a working class background, but it wasn't a wealthy middle class background. Um, Ralph Lee encouraged Ted to read. First of all, he encouraged him to read George Bernard Shaw, H.G. Wells, Maxim Gorky, Jack London. And then he encouraged Ted to read Marx, Engels and Lenin. By the time Ted was 15, he described himself as a Marxist. By 1928, Trotsky's ideas were being circulated in English by an American group called Militant. Some, came, some of these uh, uh, newspapers and magazines came to a radical bookshop in Johannesburg. This was a critique of Stalin's regime from a Marxist perspective, an analysis of why the proletarian revolution in China in 1925 and 26 had been defeated, um, identifying the mistaken analysis and, and tactics of the Stalinists. Ralph Lee got in touch with the American supporters of Trotsky. Um, it's, a, it's a different story, but it was a mistake on the part of the Stalinists that they even let this, um, this um, work of Trotsky sort of get begin to get circulated it is to do with to do with one or two Americans visiting a conference in Russia in the early 1920s and and picking up material from 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 Trotsky that um, if the Stalinists had been more alert they wouldn't have even let it um, circulate. Ted. Um, Ted, Ted and Ralph Lee and, and, and this small group they had in, in jo near Johannesburg, they orientated towards the working class to try and build, begin to build a movement of workers in that area. They built a small group of a dozen or so comrades, particularly they, they were influential in supporting a, a group of laundry workers who were trying to form a union and go on strike. M much later, well, comrades asked Ted, um, "What you know? What at this young age? What what um, kind of what inspired him to get involved in the movement?" <clears throat> and, and Ted said, "Above all, it was the appalling treatment of blacks in South Africa. He just couldn't stand seeing fellow human beings treated as um, you know second-class citizens and re really being um, humiliated and exploited." At the age of 20, in 1934, Ted moved to England um, it, it, uh, to widen his horizons. He, he moved with another young comrade called Max Bash. And uh, on the way to England, they stayed in France. Um, and Ted had a discussion with Leon Sedoff, who was Trotsky's son. 
um, who was organizing the left opposition in France. That, that was the Trotskyist movement in France. Incidentally, Tate could speak French. It was his mother's first language. Um, <clears throat> Tate changed his name as he came into England to protect his family back home. It was a time when Stalin's agents were murdering people with Trotsky's connections. Ted Grant was a name that I think Ted, uh, Ted, Ted picked up um, from, it had been one of the, the, the name of one of the sailors on the ship that was taking him from France to England. They joined a small Marxist group inside the Independent Labour Party, but after a few months they left it and joined the Labour Party because there was more scope for doing revolutionary work in a bigger party with a, with a bigger membership. The, 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 the independent Labour Party was, was diminishing by, by the, by the mid-1930s. Um, <clears throat> Labour's youth organisation was the Labour League of Youth. Ted helped to develop a Bolshevik Leninist group within the Labour Party, which later became known as the Militant Group. One of the central debates was, was with the Stalinists. It was to try and show that revolution can and must have both an international perspective and it must be founded on the democracy of the working class. Um, it, it, if, if, if the revolution, if the socialist revolution can't meet the democratic needs of the people, if it can't extend and improve upon the democracy of capitalism under bourgeois democracy, then the socialist revolution can't last. Of course, the Russian revolution had opened up a huge new meaning to the idea of democracy, because in 1917, workers' committees um, were running every factory, every workplace, every community. <clears throat> so Ted's group was involved in the, the, the campaign, all the campaigns in, in London at that time. They were fighting against the, uh, the black shirts, the Mosleyites. They were involved in the Battle of Cable Street. Um, Ralph Lee came to London later from South Africa in 1937, but returned later in, in about 1940 for per personal and health reasons. Now, the, the, the real turning point in, in the responsibility and uh, um, leadership that Ted was to give the Trotskyist movement was came after 1940 when Trotsky died. The authority of Trotsky had been enormous, having been one of the leaders of the Russian Revolution. The Trotskyist movement had its own wrangles and its own um, uh, debates and, and, uh, and in the absence of Trotsky, um, the, the debates and wrangles began to lead to splits. <clears throat> now, um, the, the starting point for this, problem that the Trotskyist movement had was um, the end of the Second World War. Trotsky, all, all Marxists need to have a perspective. You know, you have, you have, it's not a, a blueprint. It's not, it's not a, a, a firm confidence that everything that you're, that you, that you, you're projecting is going to happen but it's a, a rough idea of how things are likely to work out in the next few months, the next few years, because it enables uh, the revolutionary movement to orientate towards the, the real world and to be prepared for events that are likely to come up. And um, Trotsky had developed this perspective based on the experience of the First World War, that at the end of the Second World War, there would be an immediate uh, movement of revolution all over Europe. And it was right in a way because there was a huge movement, there were huge expectations of the working class at the end of the war um, to, um, 
to 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 have a new society to not return to the 30s that they 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 already been during the war in the in the armed forces in the british army there'd been a lot of political discussion in fact the british ruling class in the second world war were aware that the first world war had led to an extremely revolutionary situation in all countries, including Britain. The very, very militant, strong trade unionists came out of the war, came out of the trenches, determined not to be pushed around by the ruling class in the ways that they had before the war. And um, the British ruling class in the Second World War tried to control the political consciousness of the troops they actually introduced a, a, a rule that there should be political discussion in every regiment and it should be led by one of the officers of the regiment in order, of course, with the, with the hope that the officers would, um, you know, keep uh, what they saw as good sense, you know, moderation on the on the all, all the political thinking of, of the troops. And it, Ted told me the story, by the way, I, I, I knew Ted personally from 1973 till till when he when he died in um, 2006 I think it was um, and he, he told me that um, in one of these regiments the there were one or two Trotskyists from from his group in the regiment um, conscripted troops and the officers weren't organizing political discussion and um, so these these Trotskyist lads go go to the officers and say, well, you know, it's a rule. We have to have political discussion in the regiment. And so the officers said, well, you organise it yourself. We haven't got time. So it's a kind of paradox that th this um, requirement that every regiment should have political discussion um, led to, in at least one regiment, Trotskyists actually being charge of the political discussion amongst the troops. Of course, exactly the opposite of what uh, the the ruling class would have wanted from from that kind of discussion group. Um, <clears throat> Trotsky's perspective for the end of the Second World War was that there would be a big upturn in revolutionary possibility, and there was. And of course, we, I mean, we know in in Britain, we know that it led to the 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 um, huge um, uh, program of nationalization by the Attlee government, the setting up of the National Health Service and so on. Because um, if there hadn't, you, you find this in um, Ken Loach's film, The Spirit of 45, you know, that, uh, actually Attlee sent Churchill to um, bankers in New York to say, you have to provide money for a welfare state in Britain, because if we if 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 the Labour government doesn't provide a welfare state, then there'll be a revolution. The, the Labour government, if, the Labour government with a bit of with a bit of a loan from America, can perhaps just about hold back the revolution and uh, keep keep things under control without without the entire destruction of capitalism and huge swathes of industry, you know, the, the mines, the railways, um, road haulage were taken into public ownership in, in Britain as a result of the expectations and the pressure of the working class to demobilize troops and the determination that there should be no return to the poverty and the horrors of the 1930s. And the, that, that kind of mood of expectation and determination that the working class were gonna have something better after 1945 was replicated all over Europe, in, in France, there was a revolutionary movement. In, um, in, in Eastern Europe, there was great expectations for an improvement in life. And, um, and of, of course, that, that was combined with the rolling into Eastern Europe of the Red Army, who, who, who took a kind of Stalinist control over those kind of political pressures and ensured that it didn't result in a genuine movement of workers' democracy. Um, so, Ted was one of the few people in the Trotskyist movement at this time who, instead of clinging to the old perspective of Trotsky, which had become out, out, outdated because events had overtaken it, that, you know, there, there had been a revolutionary movement, it had achieved 
some steps forward for the working class, but it hadn't resulted in the workers' democracy that Trotsky had uh, uh, anticipated. And, you know, there were some people in the, the, the Trotsky movement, actually, in, in the late 1940s and early 1950s was, you, you could say, it was a somewhat impoverished movement because many of the very best cadres of, of the revolution had been murdered by Stalin. Um, and um, and Trotsky himself, who, who, who was a guiding force in that movement, had, had been murdered by Stalin. And so you had some, some people, I, I won't particularly go into names, but who just clung on to the, there will be a revolution after the war, you know, they're, 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 there's going to be a revolution tomorrow. And, you, you know, you had you had groups who really every month from 1945 onwards, there was going to be a revolution next week. And of course, it led to um, disillusionment, argument um, uh, an, an impoverishment of understanding of what was happening in the real, real world. And Ted was one of the very few leaders who came out of that period who was able not to just parrot the perspective that Trotsky had put forward before the war, but to get inside the method of Marxism and to reappraise the situation and to understand that things were now different and perspectives would have to change and we were in for a long haul and um, the task in the first place is to clarify ideas, understand what stage we're at, understand why the revolutionary movement has been halted. And that's partly because of the huge fireworks of capitalism post um, 1945, particularly post 1950, with um, you know, world trade expanding at an unprecedented level, a, 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 a great development of American capitalism um, uh, with, with Britain still able to gain some of the, um, the, the economic uh, kudos from that. And uh, it, it, it was a, a movement <clears throat> where in the advanced industrialized countries, <clears throat> Britain, France, America, Germany, and so on, <clears throat> because of the trade unions, workers were able to get a little bit more, a little bit better than what they had before. And because of that, the revolutionary guts of the movement ebbed away. And this was for, 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 for people who understood that capitalism couldn't last forever, that capitalism has to be overthrown. This was a period now of working for the long term because there was going to be no revolution in the short term. This was in the 1950s and the 1960s. Um, and Ted was one of the best theoreticians who was able to adapt and understand that and um, to reappraise the situation. what was happening in the world as a whole. There was um, a revolution in China. There was a revolution in Cuba. These, these were not revolutions uh, out of the textbooks of Marx. These were revolutions led by peasant armies. These were revolutions that overthrew capitalism, but didn't put the working class in power. And Ted was able, with his documents on the colonial revolution, to understand and explain these new developments in ways that some of the other um, so-called leaders in the Trotskyist movement really had no idea. They were just um, uh, every day um, was going to be the revolution tomorrow. And of course, their, their members got demoralized and tired and they that most of those groups uh, gradually fell to bits. Um, Ted, Ted's approach, uh, and I, I, I know this from some working with him personally, was never to get too bogged down with arguing with others on the left. He was more, in, I mean, he would, he would have a discussion, of course, if people you know, want, wanted to engage with him, but he was more interested in turning to new layers of workers who'd never been involved in the movement before. 
and introducing them to Marxist ideas, he, he always felt that it was fresh layers who would replenish the movement and be the, the kind of human material from which a new revolutionary movement could be built. Um, he was always reminding the comrades that the situation would turn that there would be new opportunities, that the, the time to build a new mass movement would arise. This was in the, the 1950s and 1960s, when uh, certainly in the early 1950s, the number of Trotskyists in Britain could be numbered in, in a few dozen. Um, and, you know, Ted, Ted had confidence that if we built, if we understood theory, if we developed gradually, uh, eventually we would get the opportunities to build a far, far bigger movement. And um, yeah, the, the, the turning point began to come in the, I suppose, the, the early 1970s with the big miners strikes and so on. And there was, there were opportunities then for through the, the Labour Party Young Socialists for the Trotskyist movement in Britain to grow significantly until by, by the 80s, by the early 80s, um, militant tendency had a membership on paper of about 8,000. And certainly in terms of activists, it was at least 6,000 comrades. Um, and everybody in the country knew about militant tendency. It was in the press um, quite frequently and, uh, uh, and a, a, a thorn in the side of the reformist Labour leaders like Neil Kinnock and so on, who spent loads of energy trying to expel um, Trotskyists from the movement. Um, so this was, this was the huge and significant life, life's work of Ted Grant that from uh, you know, uh, from from the ideas of Trotsky, refreshing those ideas and working with a small handful of comrades, Ted Grant uh, led the building of a very significant movement within the Labour Party in Britain, which came to the point where you had a city council in Liverpool that was controlled by um, Trotskyist supporters who actually uh, forced Thatcher to cave in on a whole number of budgetary proposals because she couldn't face dealing with both Liverpool City Council and the miners' strike at the same time. The, the, this, this was the, the culmination of, of the great achievement of Ted Grant that, that um, he, he, through, through his leadership, it had been possible to assemble a team of, of thousands of comrades who were able to have this huge effect on, on British society to the, to the point where there are still, you know, in, in Liverpool today, there, are, there is still a beautiful park. There are still council houses that were built by money provided by Thatcher because she had to compromise with the, with the revolutionary character of the, of the, of the, the, the district council in that in that area, Ted always he, he his watchword was turn towards the youth. Um, if you want to build the movement, um, find new young people who are you know involved in in the workforce or, or you know who are unemployed but who understand the life of the working class and and build a movement through young people. <clears throat> The turning point, I would say, in Ted's career came round about the mid uh, 1980s, round about the time of the defeat of the miners' strike, because then the situation began to change dramatically. No, it, it was the, the defeat of the air traffic controllers in the USA at the same time. It was a, a global phenomenon. That you you had you had the, the the development of new yet new opportunities consumer boom for capitalism, and the 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 hollowing out of the um, socialist um, influences inside the Labour Party to the extent that people like Tony Blair 
were able to take over the Labour Party, begin to, um, you know, transform it into an instrument for the privatisation of public services. Um, the, 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 the whole British economy had changed at this time. I mean, in, in the 1950s, um, Britain was still a manufacturing nation. By the, by the 1980s, with the Margaret Thatcher government, um, the policy had become to de-industrialise Britain because uh, Thatcher identified that a militant working class always comes with industrialization, and they, they began outsourcing um, industry to, to Asia, where labor was cheaper, where unions were repressed, and uh, they, they, they hoped against hope that uh, somehow the, the genius of um, the British uh, uh, cr creative intelligence and so on would, would fill the gap created by the absence of, of industry. Um, and the, the, the movement declined, the movement collapsed, and the movement changed. Um, now, <clears throat> everything I've said so far about, by, by the way, Tina, how much time have I got? Um, sorry, another 20 minutes? Oh, I've still got another 20 minutes. Okay, yeah, yeah, well, if you want to, yeah, no rush. Uh, okay, right. Interesting, um, carry on. <laughs> everything I've said so far about Ted <clears throat> has been praise, but I now come to a point in his life, and by the way, I love the man to bits. I mean, uh, you know, he, uh, he, was, uh, he was always good to me, and very, very patient. I disagreed with him quite a lot of the time on certain things. Sometimes he shouted at me, but he was, at the end of the day, he was always very kind to me. Um, um, but from the mid eighties, 1980s onwards, I would say <clears throat> he wasn't able to adapt and change to the new situation in the way that he had been in 1945 when Trotsky's perspective had um, failed to materialize and he was, he was so such a genius in adapting and developing new interpretations of, um, uh, of Marxism as applied to the real world situation. As the movement began to fizzle out in the late 1980s, um, Ted's group, uh, which then, um, I mean, the militant tendency split at that time. And the group that Ted, were, 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 I mean, both groups really, clung to old ideas. It, it, the situation became, if I can use an analogy, and, and all historical analogies are a bit um, um, inadequate, it, the task of building a new movement became much more like the task that Marx and Engels faced when they were building the first international in the 19th century. Um, you had to work to, to build a movement from scratch when the movement has collapsed or when the movement is non-existent. You have to work with everybody. You can't, it, it's not like in 19... 40 or, 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 or I mean, in, in 1940, there was a ready made Labour Party. You could be a member of the Labour Party and say, here we are, we have the ideas, and you could expect that workers would come to you, would identify with those ideas, see the sense in those ideas. When the movement, when the movement falls apart, you have to work with everybody who is prepared to play a part in rebuilding the movements. Marx and Engels worked with reformists, with um, anarchists. They worked with all kinds of, um, uh, you know, um, uh, pe pe people, who, pe people who were like the Owenites who expected, um, you know, to build socialism at a local level and it would gradually work outwards from there. You had, you had all kinds of different trends and tendencies in the first international. And it was used to group together all those who wanted a fairer, more just society, all those who wanted something like socialism to begin a debate, to begin a discussion in order to create a movement that could eventually clarify ideas and bring the working class to power. 
And it was no longer, by, by, by the 1990s, it was no longer appropriate to be standing with your copy of Militant saying, here we are, we're the boys, we know what to do, come to us, and everyone, you, can't exp you couldn't expect people to come to you any longer. It was a, diff it was a different situation, and um, the, the tasks were different. And Ted, unfortunately, uh, never really was able to adapt to those times. With, with a lot of other very good comrades, he was still trying to do what they had done so well in the 60s and 70s and 80s. And um, really, the, the group that he was part of, um, they're still there. They're still um, making a, a, a few ripples in the movement, but they're not... Um, they're not taken seriously by workers in struggle, um, and they're not um, they're not able to build in the way that they hope to and were so successful in doing uh, way back in the nineteen eighties. So, um, you know, the task is today something different, um, and. Uh, I'm I'm very sad that Ted wasn't able to play to continue to fully play his part in developing this sort of um, new approach that we are attempting to create today. He he suffered a stroke in 2003, and he died in 2006. Um, and um, I um, remain eternally grateful to Ted for the education. He uh, he gave to me um, when in, in in the years when I was working full time for militant tendency um, during the late seventies and the nineteen eighties and the early nineties, and that's it, Tina. It's over for discussion. Okay, thank you very much, um, Ed. That was very interesting. Um, Tony um, wants to come in in a second, um, but I thought I'll ask you, I'll ask you a couple of questions and so to get other people as well to uh, start putting their hands up and, and get involved. Um, I mean, you clearly had to have a lot of respect for him and you come from that tradition, clearly that it, it shows. Um, but I wonder in, in terms of, you know, you didn't, you didn't mention somebody else who came from South Africa at around the same time which was, of course, uh, Tony Cliff, and he built the Socialist Workers' Party, um, also on the basis, of course, that, you know, neither Moscow nor Washington, et cetera, we're, doing, we're the real Trotskyists. And that's a kind of issue that you didn't quite touch upon, the, the idea that, you know, we're doing the, the pure, you know, we're it, the sort of, the, the purely formed Trotskyists, sect i'm going to call it because that's that's what they look like to me i'm afraid you know you have this one one trend one position one opinion you know one political line and you have to keep disagreements bottled up inside you can't have it out open in the in the newspapers etc it needs to be all handled internally i mean in terms of where, where do you see the sort of you know because i come from a totally different uh, perspective for me the, the socialist workers party and the socialist party militant tendency apart from the you know the intervention in the labor party they did and now they they look like pretty similar organizations political outlook where do you see the sort of differences between tony cliff and ted grant okay um do you want me to answer that question now yes, or yeah. I, well I mean, there's quite a lot of theoretical differences. I mean, what, 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 one is that the the um, Socialist Workers Party, Tony Cliff, um, characterized characterized the so the Soviet Union as state capitalist. Um, and you'll have to ask them if you want more of an explanation of what that is. But it's it it for them, what existed in the Soviet Union was a form of capitalism. And um, it's quite clear to, from, from where I see it, that with a nationalized economy, with full employment, even though this wasn't controlled by the working class, this was something very different from capitalism. Um, th there were uh, other differences. I mean, the, the, you, again, you, you get, get somebody on from, from the Socialist Workers' Party if you want to know more about that. Tina, I mean, I'm, I recommend it because, it, you know, 
it's we this is the difference between between the times we're living in now and maybe the 1980s that um, we need to learn we we need to learn by discussing and debating with comrades in the socialist workers party i mean they had they had this theory called the permanent arms economy mm-hmm. which was to do with um, an a, an explanation of the post-war boom and why there didn't appear to be the cyclical character of capitalism that has existed in the 19th century and the early 20th century that there was you know continuous economic growth from 1945 through to about 1970 75 you know and um they the, the socialist workers party were explaining that through something to do with the development of the armaments industry um so you know the yeah um these these are debates that we we will learn if we go back to them and yeah i mean my point is that of course you don't need to split over these kind of things you know that sects that makes makes you sects you know you can't work with others because they disagree on this and disagree on that particular um so i think there's a similarity between them especially now i mean now there's i I don't know what distinguishes the swp and the socialist party anymore yeah i mean i i do do agree with you tina that, that there is plenty of scope for what and and by the way i mean i i live in northumberland now but five years ago I lived in Norfolk and we had this was before the movement really was doing very much we had a small group called the Norfolk Coalition Against the Cuts and we worked very very closely with you know the the few of us who were activists I had good friends in the SWP and we worked very closely with them I mean it you know it doesn't matter a hoot whether you agree with the permanent arms economy or not if you're if you're on a picket line and you're trying to support workers who are on strike that the important thing is that you stand together. And I got, you know, I got on, I still have good friends in, in the, in Tony Cliff's party. So, you know, there's plenty of scope for healing these bitter arguments that did take place. Tony has got a question or a comment. Uh, yeah, no, I think it's more of a comment. Can you hear me okay? All good. I can, Tony. I can. Yeah, hi, Ed. Uh, I think with respect to you, uh, this is a version of Millicent's history, which is being seen through rose-tinted spectacles. Uh, and I, I can't agree with much of it. Undoubtedly in Liverpool, Millicent did have great achievements. I, I don't think anyone can gainsay it, though the wind was blowing in their favour in the sense that it was a minor strike on. And there's no doubt that when uh, Patrick Jenkin conceded in I think it was 1984 uh, and raised the grant it was because he didn't want to take on both Liverpool and the local authorities who weren't setting a rate and the miners at the same time so they waited one year and then of course defeated Liverpool Uh, but I mean nonetheless I mean there's no doubt that they built a great deal and uh, there are solid achievements dating from that time but my my main criticism of militants is it It has an economistic uh, approach uh, to politics. It's incredibly mechanical in the the way it views things. And that that was apparent in the Labour Party with its demand for the nationalisation of uh, the commanding heights of the economy via a Labour government, which, of course, is totally impossible. I mean, it did see uh, the existing state machinery as being adaptable and usable by revolutionaries in order to change society. I think that was a fundamental mistake. Uh, and it, 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 it became almost laughable when Millicent were describing the police who were used as Thatcher's cavalry as workers in uniform. I mean, they weren't. They were agents, uh, almost the armed wing of the state, which was used to smash uh, the miners. We, we know that. Uh, and likewise, uh, I mean, the posing up to the Prison Officers Association, whose members have an absolutely appalling record uh, in terms of prisoners and uh, other aspects of uh, the state. Uh, so, I mean, I just can't accept that. But the, the uh, my key criticism of it is over the national question. 
which it completely got wrong. I mean, it was even in Ireland, it failed to understand that partition represented the division of the working class between uh, North and South, between Catholic and Protestant. And it, it tended to dismiss it. In fact, it did dismiss it as completely irrelevant on the basis that what you wanted was unity of the working class, but it failed to understand at any point why the working class was not united. And if you simply ignore the national question in the hope you can have a false unity, uh, you're in for a surprise. And of course, the Protestant and the loyalist working class to this day, unfortunately, because they see themselves as allied with the British state as a settler working class, uh, they are still uh, politically extremely reactionary, yet militant was cozying up to some of the worst elements in the Protestant community on the basis that they could ignore the national question. I would also say on Zionism, it's, it's exactly similar. They've never understood Zionism and what uh, settler colonialism in Palestine was uh, and why in a settler state, the working class, the settler working class allies with its own ruling class, which is why such states are often so strong. Uh, and in Israel, of course, we see that today, where the working class is to the right of its own bourgeoisie in many ways, uh, and extremely racist. Uh, so, I mean, those are those are my two uh, main criticisms. Uh, and remember what I, Marx said about Ireland, that a nation that oppresses another shall not itself be free. So Millicent never gave any support whatsoever to the Troops Out movement or those demanding an end to the British presence in Ireland. And that, I think, was a pretty catastrophic mistake. Uh, so, I mean, I'll, I'll leave it at there. But I, I would just say on the Socialist Party, I don't know what your present political allegiances are, Ed, uh, but the Socialist Party seems to be having a crazy trajectory at the moment. For example, uh, in unison, I mean, there was a savage attack by the right on Paul Holmes, the national president, who was dismissed by Kirkley's council. And yet the Socialist Party has run with the uh, attacks on Paul at Kirklees and said, yes, there is justification for the, for the allegations of bullying being made against him, even though his own branch has fully backed him. Uh, so you actually had objectively the Socialist Party being on the right in that. And I, I think that's a very great political mistake. They actually, a Socialist Party member, actually provided evidence in the disciplinary against Paul Holmes. So how you've got in, or how they have got into that position, uh, who God only knows. Thank you. Interesting points, Tony. Um, Ed, you can reply now, or you can listen to a few contributions if you want. Um, well, it's probably better if, I mean, they're, 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 you know, I'm, I listen with, with, with a lot of respect and interest to what Tony said, and there's a lot of things I want to say, but it's maybe better if the discussion flows a bit, and I'll come back a bit later to you. Okay, okay. Yep, no problem. Thanks for your contribution, Tony. Um, Matthew. Yeah, I mean, I think, <coughs> really, I mean, you know, um, in terms of, of, of an analysis of, of, of Ted Grant, I mean, you, you have to say, I mean, the, the point being, he, he's one of the tearing viewers, if you like, of, of, of British Trotskyism. Um, and so you really need to sort of dig, dig into the sort of debates that were going, I mean, that have gone through that. Um, and of course, it, you know, it's not because Britain is in a, was in a peculiar position, as it were, um, you know, it wasn't dominated by Stalinism and the working class is right well to be open. And therefore, particularly from the 60s, 50s, 60s onwards, Trotskyism in Britain has had a huge impact, uh, and that that that's had an had an international impact as well. Because all, you know, most of the British groups have managed to organise to to uh, to a greater or lesser degree internationally. And therefore, you know, British politics has been exported uh, all over the place and had a huge huge impact. Um, it's unfortunate, you, you know, you can go back to the you know the days actually. Um, you know, the the, the Tyrannvirs are of course. Um, Cliff, Grant, and Healy, and they were all actually in one organization, the Revolutionary Communist Party after the Second World War. And you, you missed out, of course, the legend that the, the, the three of them shared a caravan in Islington, and all the arguments in British Trotskyism can be understood by the disagreements of these three people in one caravan in Islington. Uh, but I mean, ser you know, the more, more seriously, of course, what you were looking at really was, was a, a, 
as you as you outline, is of course the the the, the stability, the stabilization of capitalism, particularly of course by Stalinism, and the impact of Stalinism to to suppress the revolution movement. The revolution movement existed, uh, and 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 you know really, if if Stalin hadn't been present, would have actually you know by by right actually taken over. You know countries like Italy and France and so on and so forth would have fallen to the working class. No no question of it. But however, the Stalinists actually stabilized capitalism. And the question was, okay, what was the what was the position of the Trotskyists in terms of, 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 of Stalinism and their understanding of Stalinism, which is a, a central point. Now, uh, actually, of course, I mean the, the, the key thing about the about uh, uh, Tony Cliff and his tendency, you know, through to the, the IS and then the SWP, of course, is his state capitalism. And, and the legend in that, of course, was this was a part of an argument between between Ted Grant and Tony Cliff, in which Ted Grant actually started off espousing state capitalism, and they argued with, with each other, and it wound up that T Tony Cliff adopted state capitalism and Ted Grant rejected it. So they actually you know, went, went the opposite way. So, however, of course, I mean, it, it, you know, in those terms, of course, the, the, the characterizing the, the um, Soviet Union or, or, or China or whatever is as capitalist, is clearly just wrong. I mean, it's you know the first first part of, of Capital Volume One. You know, the uh, you know, capitalism presents itself as as as, as uh, you know a mass of commodities. Now, the Soviet Union never produced a commodity. Um, you know, certainly not a manufactured one. Um, in 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 those terms, uh, it, 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 it's wrong on its face, and it, you know, it, it's then of course well, what was the what was the 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 whole you know. Position the Trotskyists. And what tended, what's tended to happen, of course, was the Trotskyists actually adapted to Stalinism, and there was this, you know, the whole tendency of, of what was called Pabloism, led by Michel Pablo, who was the head of the the FI at the time, um, and all of the three uh, basically ha had deals with with Pablo at one time or another. You know, Healy he, he supported Pablo, of course, until Pablo started building an organization inside of Healy's tendency, uh, which, <laughs> which is one thing he really objected to, you know, political objection. So he went with the, with the American SWP, who were far more, you know, actually far more politically astute and actually we were trying to analyze the problem and actually all the stuff, real, real stuff that was done at the time um, around the whole question was done in the SWP in the US and not in Britain at all. Um, Ted Grant actually had a, himself actually had a was was had the franchise from 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 Pablo's section of the of the Fourth International in the sixties, so you know there's there's that thing until until of course they built their own section, uh, and and Ted Ted Grant moved away. Um, so I mean there's there's, there's 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 there are these real serious deep questions. Um, I mean in terms of say you know if you look at the the the, the, the trajectory of the militants. I mean, initially, of course, as you say, it goes into the Labour Party in, in the 50s, and the, particularly the 60s, and actually constitutes, along with, with Cliff, a, 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 an organisation called Young Guard in the, in the early 60s and through the, through, through, the, through the 60s. And then, of course, it's, it's actually then <coughs> Cliff who um, moves away from the Labour Party because basically after, after in place of strife, of course, what it did was, was actually destroy much of the organization of the Labour Party as a mass organization. And so, and the, the development of the, of the shop sewers movement, the, 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 the IS, it was Cliff's IS who was able to, 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 to uh, grow from that. Um, whereas, I mean, Militant didn't really grow until, until after that process. And really it was a different, a, a, on a bit different base. I mean, the base of the Militant from what I, I saw actually was on, was was based on community organizing, organizing rather than you know particularly I mean although I knew I mean the you know, the old militant did have you know a whole series of people shop series but the actual growth real serious growth of the militant like sectors was based on the organizing communities. Um, however, in those terms, what did you know what you you outline you know, the, 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 the the organization did tend to turn towards. Um, you know, new layers and so on and so forth. Um, but of course, what it tended to do, and, and it wasn't alone in that, was of course to adapt to, to the working class and fail to challenge the working class in, the, in, in, its, in its prejudices and in its politics. And in fact, of course, you know, it, 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 at the same time, you know, you, you're then looking at the deficiencies of the, of, of the militant itself in terms of its understanding of either capitalism or indeed imperialism.
Uh, and so the position of the militants on any number of wars, I mean, Ireland is, is a start, but, but all the others of Falkland's war and all the rest of it were hopelessly, you know, they, they, they refused to challenge the, the, the ruling class. Sorry? Can you yeah. wind up now, please? Okay, yeah, 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 sorry. I mean, I think, I think it's it's an important topic to open up, and I think, it, yeah, thanks Fred for doing it, but I think there's a lot more in there, and we have to be deeply critical of the politics of this thing, you know, really, and what lessons we can learn from this thing, from this, you know, and I, I think it's really important in, the, in in this period to understand why we are at, why we are where we are at the moment, and, the, and these three guys, Cliff Grant and Healy, have a hell of a lot to do with it, thanks. Yep. Thank you. Um, Ed, if you want to, whenever you want to speak, you tell me, yeah? Um, well, let's, let's hear a few more contributions. And yeah, then I'll okay. come back. Thank, thanks, Tina. That's Roger. Oh, okay. Well, I'm sorry that I uh, I missed the beginning of Ed's lead off. I, for some reason, I thought the meeting was starting at 6.30. So I apologize uh, to Ed and also <coughs> apologize if, if some of the things I say are uh, really re going over ground which has already been covered. But I think you know, I too was a personal comrade and I think I could say a friend of Ted Grant for at least a quarter of a century before we parted ways politically. And as a colorful and oversized personality, he certainly had more than his fair share of personal foibles and idiosyncrasies. And these, of course, were grossly exploited by the spiteful venom of people who, by comparison, I think, were political dwarfs. You know, he began political life in exile in the teeth of worldwide counter-revolution against the pressures of fascism and impending world war, and worse still, of course, the hostility of the proletarian vanguard under the spell of Stalinism. And fighting off the added curse of sectarian intrigues he and his small circle during and after the war built the cadre of uh, a significant, though small, Trotskyist party in Britain, the RCP. And um, certainly from the way I see it, alone among all his contemporaries, he had the courage and the willpower to review the realities of the post-war world and challenge the false perspectives of uh, all these sectarian groups. For them, Marxism had, in effect, stopped or been frozen with the murder of Trotsky in 1940, even to the extent uh, that in 1947, of course, Trotsky had said within 10 years, he said in 1938, within 10 years, the Fourth International will be the decisive force on the planet. And there were actually some uh, morons who in 1947 were saying, ah, well, there's still a year to go, and who knows, you know, he might be proved right and so on. And I, I, Ted Grant was the first to recognize that the prognoses of 1938 had become, um, uh, had become obsolete, they'd become inadequate. And as a result, he was ostracized, he was isolated, and he was forced to begin again from nothing. And in the course of a whole period, it was Ted Grant who formulated the only clear analyses of entirely new phenomena in world history, the economic upswing, the deformed workers' states, the colonial revolution, proletarian bodomitism, the political revolution, and of course, a corresponding method of tactical work in turning towards the mass organizations away from sectarianism uh, and a new variant of entryism in the mass uh, workers' parties. And I think that throughout the 40s, 50s, 60s, and most of the 70s, his worldview remained fundamentally sound and capable of withstanding the test of events. And he trained two successive generations of cadres and built uh, a theoretical foundation for the most successful mass Trotskyist movement uh, for, uh, for decades. And so all tribute to his sheer willpower, resilience and endurance, which was his great strength. But unfortunately, those same, uh, those same qualities proved to be a, a weakness uh, at a uh, later stage, because the ideas that he put forward, which were which held valid for three decades, I'm afraid that he persisted in them for another two or three decades beyond that, beyond the fact that they had become that they corresponded um, to reality. So when the uh, that epoch came to an end with the you know with the 
late 70s, early 80s, those characteristics which have been such an indispensable asset became a harmful and a negative break on the movement and a fatal stranglehold on further development. And um, the tragedy for Ted Grant was his incapacity to apply the same audacity and insight to this new historical turn in the situation as he had uh, in, in, uh, in his youth. And that was the mainspring of the split of 1991. Just one word on that. It seems to be an iron law with, uh, with small groups that uh, when their membership drops below a certain point, that's when they declare themselves a party. That's how it happened with, uh, with the Healy group, with the Cliff group, and then it happened again with um, with Militant when it declared itself a socialist party. It's almost kind of a desperate attempt to think that by, by uh, puffing themselves up into a party that they could somehow attract a, a momentum and a... Um, uh, you know, some a support which they couldn't uh, in the past, and Ted quite correctly saw that as a as a uh, retrograde step and as a blunder. But unfortunately, he was not able. He was not flexible enough. He was not he he was not um, able to adapt to the completely new sit uh, situation in the world. He he couldn't accept. The, uh, the downfall. Uh, the last sentence: the downfall of the Stalinist regime. He couldn't affect the. Couldn't um, understand the qualitative change in the situation in the workers' parties and so on. And he ended up, or his group ended up, sadly fighting yesterday's wars in a peculiar sort of time warp, and still fighting for, um, among other things, labour to power on a socialist program which of course is completely uh, redundant and completely um, out of kilter with reality at the, at the time. But nevertheless, all tributes to his successes in his uh, formative years. And I think we have a lot to learn from his life. Thank you, Roger. Um, Paul. I know, uh, can you hear me? Yep. I know that in certain parts of the left, well, I call them left, but the Labour vote likes to use the term "trox" uh, as an insult, but but I'm beginning to discover that um, if you talk about schools of Marxism, um, Trotskyism in, in itself seems a very wise school of thought. It deserves like a school of its own, as um, I think, because I mean, well, there are a couple of things that uh, that sort of puzzled me. Um, uh, I've heard some people say that uh, um, that uh, socialist appeal was militant. I've also heard Tuck describe themselves as formerly militant. And so Ed's comment that there was a split basically answers that point for me, I think. Because <laughs> I, I remember thinking, well, which, which group is it that was militant? Is it them or them, you know? Uh, and... Uh, I think it's clear that there was obviously a split. Um, uh, with regards to SWP and Tusk, I can add to that point straight away. Um, I mean, well, the thing about Tusk is they're basically the, ele the electoral vehicle of the Socialist Party, along with our and any other group that might well be involved, affiliated to it. But SWP, uh, one of my bugbugs bug about them is they're not an electoral vehicle. They get involved with various groups for individual campaigns on many things, and I often take their stance on certain aspects. But um, but yeah, they don't. They're not an electoral vehicle, so, so that's the key difference. Um, I thought it was interesting having started to read Ted Grant's from Revolution to Counter-Revolution, which seems quite a cute book. It's going to take me ages to get through that. I learned quite early on that he, he used the term in the book, um, ultra leftist. And so I thought, hang on here, this is obviously a cocky movement that has uh, quite a wide left 
wide left, left and right. And of course, the SWP, Tony Cliff section, I'm sure Ted Grant obviously regards, would have regarded SWP as the ultra left. Um, in one respect, because um, it's well known that uh, the SWT, SWP part of Marxism, uh, Trotskyism, which I tend to agree with, is that the um, Stalinism was basically state capitalism. But Ted Grant, in his book, seemed to reject that as an oversimplification. Um, and he might be right. Maybe it was a uh, maybe it was a very simplistic way of looking at it. Anyway, I thought that was all very interesting. I stop there. Thanks. Thank you. The RMT has left um, task, by the way. Um, Barry, please. Can you can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I think the speaker um, was repeating uh, myths about Ted Grant uh, and Militant. Um, he did raise the point about the origins of the group in South Africa, and he repeated the myth about Ted Grant and his comrades having a unique ability to relate to the working class, that they were always, they always stressed agitational work and they had some kind of unique ability to relate to workers that other groups didn't have. And that was, I think, part of their sect mentality. We never really hear any details of what made them so unique in that respect. Um, we hear vague talk about laundry workers. We don't know how significant uh, the strike of laundry workers was, how many laundry workers were involved, and, and what made that experience, what made Ted Grant uh, such a unique personality in terms of politics um, that other tendencies didn't appreciate. When they came to London, again, you got the same emphasis that they had some kind of unique approach to workers Ralph Lee and Ted Grant. I think Ralph Lee at that time was the leader. But um, again, we never really know what this consisted of. Uh, reading the various histories of Trotskyism, apparently they sold more papers at Hyde Park than anyone else. Um, they were a tightly knit group because I think they'd lived together in a lodging house in South Africa. So they were a very tight group. So. Obviously, they knew each other very well and they were very active. But again, you know, we, we don't hear any details of why they were so unique and, you know, what was their big contribution. I mean, the speaker repeated the myth about Ted Grant being, if not the only one, or I think another comrade talked about him being the first one, uh, to realise that there would be a boom after the war and not. Uh, catastrophic recession. Now, that is completely untrue. And uh, the comrade who spoke um, used a very vague term about, uh, he implied that everyone else thought there was revolution tomorrow. I mean, this is quite wrong, isn't it? Uh, if you just take one example, Tony Cliff. Now, whatever you might think about the theory of permanent arms economy, and whatever you think about whether it really did explain why there was a boom, it obviously was an attempt to explain the boom. In other words, he broke from the perspective of a catastrophic slump as well. So not everyone believed in revolution tomorrow morning. So that's a, a, a kind of a crude uh, misinterpretation of many Trotskyists. I mean, if you look at, say, the foundation document of the militant group, uh, a brief statement uh, that they don't usually like publicizing, uh, but if you look at that foundation document, what, what makes it distinctive? I mean, it's full of generalities like 
we agree with the first four congresses of the Communist International. That's very worthy, but I think most Trotskyists would go along with that as well, even though there is a lot of fundamental weaknesses in, in those conferences and why be so uncritical. But anyway, there is nothing in that foundation document to make them a distinctive political force. They were just a sect based on ego, based on personality, and a lot of the split with the Fourth International was based on personalities. They just believed they had a greater uh, capacity to relate to workers, although they didn't do this very well. Their perspective of long-term entry into the Labour Party and transforming the Labour Party, it, uh, it really didn't... Um, it didn't really meet any of Trotsky's criteria for entry. And although they kept repeating that the workers would turn in the 1960s and 1970s to the Labour Party, once they became involved in struggle, they kept repeating that, but it still didn't convince people because the mass of workers didn't go into the Labour Party to struggle. For example, the Vietnam uh, Solidarity Campaign um, dismissed by uh, Ted Grant as petty bourgeois students and so on. But one minute. Now, you, would, oh, right. you would have thought that he would have welcomed the uh, mass mobilization against the Vietnam War since he regarded Vietnam as a worker state or some kind of worker state. And that's the other point, of course, that um, rather than um, path-breaking new theoretical discoveries, he clung on to the old dogma about nationalization, that if you had a significant part of nationalization, then that would be some kind of worker state. For example, Burma, over 50% nationalization, and irrespective of uh, dictatorship and workers having no control whatsoever, uh, you could still have some kind of worker state. So, Rather than any theoretical breakthroughs, you've got a clinging on uh, to old dogma. And when struggles, I think one of the famous examples of militant activity and the, the comrades did a great job, of course, in the poll tax. But the poll tax took place outside the Labour Party and many of the comrades involved in militant drew the lesson from that that are uh, waiting for workers to go into the Labour Party or transforming the Labour Party, or the Labour Party seizing power for a socialist programme through Parliament. Again, that's a, a revision of the Marxist theory of the state, of course, and uh, really has nothing to do with Trotsky. And Can you wind up now, please, Comrade? Yeah, OK, Tina, yeah. Well, you know, there's so many points to make, but um, I think I've gone on long enough as you... Uh, as you is, uh, so I'll end it there. Okay, thank you, Comrade. Um, Ian, please. Hi, I'd like to start on a slightly different note, um, but I'll definitely get on to a couple of um, big political questions. But on a personal note, my um, closest comrade in Labour Party work, certainly locally, Graham Wilson, who sadly died quite suddenly just uh, before lockdown, um, was also a close personal friend of uh, Ted Grant in his uh, later years and, and swore by him. And that was a big uh, uh, recommendation to me, for, for one thing, getting onto the uh, uh, political side of it. Um, Graham certainly didn't fit the kind of stereotype um, of the militant that as somebody who's had a lot of SWP background, I was in it for a couple of years, um, but also some militant background, not directly, but in the Scottish Socialist Party. Um, and then again, with a lot of comrades um, in the Corbyn years, um, still coming out of that, there is the, this feeling of militant sometimes being weak on imperialism, racism, gay rights, and so on. Um, and uh, Graham wasn't. Um, I don't think socialist appeal are particularly these days either. They're actually very good on Ukraine. I'm not now, nor have I ever been a supporter of socialist appeal. <laughs> Just so you know. But they do seem to be orienting towards the youth in, in a more vibrant way than a lot of groups. It's And also going back to the um, 
some of the works of Ted Grant from the 30s and 40s, and he seemed to be one of the big figures of British Trotskyism. Um, again, uh, internationalist perspective, anti-imperialist and so on. Um, it seems that perhaps the more bureaucratic, more narrow perspective of when Militant got really big, uh, that might have been us uh, uh, not just associated with him personally, though he may well have been a part of that, but maybe perhaps more associated with the side that split from him, given that the Socialist Party today, uh, though there's good comrades in them, seem to be a particularly uh, uh, particularly sick, they've been on a particularly sectarian turn of late and very bureaucratic and, and so on. Um, I thought a lot of what Barry just said was a bit negative. Um, that said, I agree that I find it hard sometimes to see, unlike with Tony Cliff um, in the 40s, state capitalism, um, what the unique idea of, of Ted Grant uh, was in those uh, days, um, as opposed to being a, a, an activist who was probably more often right than wrong, and a good organiser and so on, um, and with a great history going back a lot further than Tony Cliff, but there's not one like, that's the thing with state capitalism. On the other hand, for someone of my generation and uh, thinking back even to 20 years ago when I first got involved with the SSB and very much on the side of, uh, in those days, building left of Labour uh, parties at the height of the Blair years, the big idea associated with Ted Grant latterly was uh, to remain in the Labour Party, uh, entrism, so-called. But uh, I don't think necessarily in the kind of pejorative way that Barry was talking about, oh, we'll just stay in long enough and then we'll take over but a perspective that said that uh, the workers, the movement, will move through its through their traditional organisations um, uh, when struggle picks up. And he was proven right about that, at least in Britain with uh, Corbynism. I don't think it was ever a uh, totally dogmatic approach from socialist appeal either. I don't think anyone's saying that Marxists in Greece should be in PASOK, it having been overtaken by uh, Syriza, which then turned out to be quite right-wing reformist itself. Um, and uh, uh, there was always the talk, I think, in the split in the 90s that uh, there may come a time when having moved through their traditional uh, organisations, uh, the struggle goes on. It's not necessarily that we definitely take them over, but that these organizations can't be ignored and I think uh, certainly the experience of Corbynism proved Ted Grant right and perhaps people like me in the early uh, noughties and uh, uh, 2010s are uh, wrong. Um, so I'd just like to ask about um, that perspective on the struggle in the Labour Party. Also Barry was wrong about the um, Yes, it's true in the 60s and 70s, but then what about the 80s with Benism? So it's actually happened uh, twice. But I'd like to ask uh, what Ed um, thinks of um, that particular uh, specific idea of Ted Grant, which is what I've always associated with him. And where I think uh, back when we were both active for a couple of years over that, uh, he was probably right and I was probably wrong. <laughs> Okay, um, we've got two more people uh, who want to ask questions or make contributions, then Ed can reply. Harry, please. Um, uh, hi, comrades. Um, I mean, the first thing is, is that the militant position in the national question, they always had a socialist perspective to the national question, particularly in Ireland. And that perspective is borne out to be correct. Um, for the number of decades since they had it. I mean, I, dis I disagree very much with Tony's comments. Um, the militant was never drawn into, you know, nationalists and having a nationalist approach. And when you look at Ireland, they've always argued that there is not a capitalist solution to the problem of Ireland and that the only one was unity of the working class on a socialist perspective that can solve the Irish problem. That position has always and, and remains to this day borne out. We never went down the road of nationalism. 
And it was one of the great, I think, things about the militant is that, is that perspective. But what I really want to talk about is that, uh, you know, Ed maybe thought that towards the late 90s, 80s rather, that Ted Grant had perhaps lost his way um, and became very rigid. But one thing that I think has been borne out to be correct, and that was in the debate that began in 1991, when the militant discussed moving outside the mass working class organizations, particularly the Labour Party in Britain. And um, Ted opposed that. And the argument that he put forward at that time, by the way, I never got to meet Ted Grant, one of the great regrets of my life, but uh, we were made aware of his arguments and they led to the split. Ted argued that one, it would undo the great amount of work that took decades in the making of building a very powerful movement inside the Labour Party, and that it would be completely destroyed by this movement away from the Labour Party. The second thing is that it would lead to the demise of the Committee of the Workers International, and it was a powerful international organized in over 30 countries of the world, very active and very educated. And that too is what he argued against. And the third is that the militant would become a sect outside the mass movement. And their great achievements was always when they were inside the Labour Party. And by the way, none more so than the poll tax. That previous speaker is wrong. The, the poll tax and non-payment would not have happened if the militant had not been inside the Labour Party. They were the connection to the working class millions did not pay their poll tax or refused or were going to refuse to not pay the poll tax. The great success was inside the Labour Party. And Ted stood very, very much against that um, as moving outside in the open turn. And of course, it wasn't just the Labour Party in Britain. It was moving outside mass organisations right across the globe. His perspective proved sadly to be correct. The militant in a matter of less than a decade, uh, effectively went into basically a small sect that it, that it is today. I don't know, and maybe Ed can answer this, is whether or not Ted Grant really realized at that stage of what was really happening in the militant. In my own opinion, there was a Stalinist bureaucracy developing inside the militant, and that led to a purge, and a massive purge at that. The purge of the genuine, in my opinion, Trotskyites, myself was purged out. I think Ed was purged out. Roger, all of these, we were all purged out of the, out of the, the militant because of a Stalinist takeover inside the militant. But to be honest with you, I think very, very much exists to this very day. Ted was correct on that perspective. I know Roger has a different perspective today to our orientation towards the Labour Party, which I think has been a bit tainted in his criticisms of Ted um, because he's, he said, he's basically saying that Ted was wrong. Ted was not wrong. Ted was correct on that movement that destroyed the CWI in, in, internationally. Had we have had the CWI in that force today, I think we would be in a much better position to overthrow capitalism on a world scale we don't have such an international today that was Trotskyite based and the mass orientation towards the working class. And I think that's been the greatest, saddest legacy that we have now. Ted Grant, I think, had he, have, had he have got his way, would have been proven and our situation would be very much better today than it is now. Thank you. Thanks, Harry. Well, it's certainly leading to a lot of discussion. Um, Terry, please. Uh, uh, sorry, Tina, this is uh, Terry's husband, uh, Stephen. Oh, hi. Sorry, is Stephen. Okay. Yes, sure, of course. <laughs> yeah. Um, first of all, I mean, your topic tonight is about Ted Grant. And as I don't want to speak about something that I know so little about, um, but, but in the introduction, there was so much discussion on another item that I do know a little about, um, I'd just like to make a contribution about the Fourth International. 
um, and take up one of the points that you've made, which, which in, a, in a way is quite insightful when you talk about sex and their tendency to split and not being able to deal with any de democratic discussion. Now, I know that you know a chap called Mike McNair, but he, if in his, um, perhaps in his, in his more generous moments, will know some of the inside story of the Fourth International. Fourth International, uh, founded in 1938, based upon the transitional program, but the British sex, especially that around uh, Jerry Healy, were never the main parties of the Fourth International. Now, we know just briefly in the potted history that in 1952-53, you had to split inside the Fourth International, mainly the one led by um, the American SWP that Healy, to some extent, was in tandem with, a minor part, party, by the way. The others were the Europeans around Pierre Frank, Ernest Mandel. Now, I'm not going to make a simple little potted history, as I believe the attempt to describe Trotskyism um, has taken place on this show tonight, although I don't want to be insulting. But to me, and I don't want to be, try and pretend to be too academic, but to me, this, this isn't for anyone who's got a real interest in the Fourth International. The, all, this is all documented. It's all in the documents of the, of the Fourth International. It's in the documents of the splits that took place in the Fourth International after the war in 52, 53, and in the reunification of the main sections of the Fourth International in 1963. They're called the reunification papers. Um, now, within those discussions, you can see there was a very rich discussion from different points of view that has always been accepted and democratic discussion and the avoidance of going off and setting up your own little tent. There's always been that. Now, I was a member of the International Marxist Group throughout the 1970s and 1980s. So I've got a personal lived history in, although the Brit that British group, which was very much involved in that radical wave in the 60s and the campaign uh, against the Vietnam War, um, it was very involved in that, but I can remember the discussions that used to go on inside the, uh, the International Marxist Group and inside the Fourth International, the Un uh, United Secretariat of the Fourth International, as it was described at the time. So I've got I've got a, a lived experience that, and I you know I don't want to make anything as these silly little uh, kind of attack. Uh, not attack, um, like uh, brownie points that people try and score. And it's, it's like, it's so poor. It's such a poor way of understanding Trotskyism for, and the Fourth International. And I really recommend anyone who has a real interest and doesn't just repeat things, their, their own personal prejudice, go in and look at those documents. Now, one of the problems that came up, Jerry Healy, if this is viewing Trotskyism through British centric, centric, centric eyes, and he, he came up with this term he, so that he could, so that the, what he called the fourth international, the international committee, which was mainly him, and for a small amount of time, um, the, um, the what's names in France, I can't remember what those, their names is now, they've tended to die out a bit uh, in France, it, 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 but even they didn't last very long. But uh, they came up with this term to justify themselves called Pabloism. Now, dear old Michel Pratt Pablo, for all of these weaknesses, do you know what he did? And do you know what the Fourth International did? They organized solidarity with the Algerian revolution during the Algerian War of Independence. You know, they had arms factories supplying the Al Algerians. Now, um, Michel Pablo, so much so, the solidarity of Michel Pablo was so much, he was offered a position in Ben Bella's government, which was the first government of the Algerian Revolution, which was overthrown shortly later by um, who then became the president. 
So there's a rich history there. And unfortunately, people know nothing about it because it's so, it's so uh, these British groups that really what, you know, I mean, they've, they've trounced the history, the real history of the Fourth International, because it is out there. Out there. If you, uh, an interesting book I would point someone to, and this isn't sen uh, sectarian point scoring, but that gives a better overall view is Pierre Frank's History of the Fourth International. This was a person, this was one of the, uh, you've got to remember that Pierre Frank and um, um, some of the American SWP leaders, they were secretaries. They were, they, they went to, uh, they, they went to Mexico with Trotsky and were Trotsky's personal secretaries. Joseph Hansen was actually one of his bodyguards at the time when Trotsky was assassinated. So the, the, some of the main figure, figures, intellectual figures, I mean, I've got, you know, I've got to be careful here because I don't want to sound sectarian, but people outside of the Trotskyist movement will recognize some figures, some intellectual figures in the Fourth International that are well, well, well known. Ernest Mandel, you know, so when we discuss the, fourth, the Trotskyism, talk about the Fourth International, talk about real history, although your discussion tonight was about Ted Grant, who I know really very little about, I don't want to make any, I, you know, we could talk about Northern Ireland and how we thought the Protestant workers joining up with Protestant workers, so-called Protestant workers, who were UDA members inside the Belfast shipyards and thinking that, that you could have a, a joint front with them rather than the nationalist struggle. You know, it, it's so- you wind up now, please, Comrade. There's so much hyperbole in the discussion tonight, in the introduction tonight, it's full of hyperbole. All that nonsense about the revolutionary movement after the Second World War, hyperbole in Britain. I'm not talking about in Italy. I'm not talking about in Yugoslavia, but in Britain. This is how the British sex, people who split away from the Fourth International, gave the image of the Fourth International to British viewers, unfortunately. But speak to Mike Nair about it. Anyway, thanks. That's my uh, short point tonight. Good night, comrade. Thank you. Um, Tony wants to come back in briefly, I'm sure. Uh, yes, uh, I will try and be as brief as possible. I mean, I, I confess I, I am no expert on the history of tr Trotskyism and the various sects, but as far as I'm concerned, the term Trotskyism itself today is meaningless. You have a whole variety of Trotskyist groups, some of which, like the AWL, are positively reactionary. I mean, they, there's no other word for it. Groups like, I call them the anti-communist resistance, but they are actually called the anti-capitalist resistance, have gone full steam ahead in supporting NATO's proxy war in Ukraine. And they're led by, uh, I was going to call him Sir Gilbert Achkar, but uh, he isn't yet knighted, who supports NATO intervention in Libya, uh, who, who's basically a Zionist. I mean, so, I mean, really, I, I don't think Trots, the term Trotskyism has any valid meaning. But it's on the question of Ireland that I really cannot agree uh, with Harry. You saw in 1969, as a result of the raising of demands for basic civil liberties, that is no gerrymandering, one person, one vote, etc., a full-scale attack by the Northern Ireland statesman on the nationalist, the Catholic population. Uh, and not to support uh, the Republican movement, in its fight uh, against that, I, I think was absolutely disgraceful. I mean, of course, uh, there were problems within it, of course, as there are within any national movement. But Lenin made it clear that there is a complete difference between the nationalism of the oppressed and the nationalism of the oppressor. And the, the Catholics were the oppressed. The Protestants, I'm afraid, were the oppressors and failed to understand that basic fundamental difference in Ireland in essence meant that militant were on the side of the British. They refused to call for the withdrawal of troops, for example, uh, a very, very basic demand. Their belief that, yes, we have unity of the working class. Well, we're all in favor of unity of the working class, but does that mean you play down issues which divide the working class 
often chauvinist issues. I mean, it used to be gay rights was held to be an issue which would divide and alienate the working class. I mean, Militant came round eventually uh, on the left uh, to, a, to the right position. But the idea that you support partition because it would alienate the Protestant working class is an absolute absurdity. I mean, to be very brief, I mean, Britain took a position, British imperialism took a position really in the early 19th century under the influence of theoreticians like Edward Gibbon Wakefield, that one of the ways to diffuse the revolutionary sentiments of the British working class was to export the unemployed to what became settler colonies. And in those settler colonies, whether it was South Africa, whether it was eventually Palestine or where, whatever, the settler working class allied with its own ruling class. And that's exactly what happened in Ireland. For 50, 60 years, the Protestant working class were supporting and voting for the unionist parties, which in the British Parliament were allied with the Conservatives. So they weren't even able to form their own basic Labour Party, let alone a socialist party. And of course, given that partition, and which Connolly described uh, uh, us would become a carnival of reaction on both sides of the border. And he was absolutely right. It was incumbent upon any socialist to oppose partition and to oppose the attacks uh, on the nationalist community, incidentally, in 1921. I mean, there were many Protestant workers who were allied with the Catholic workers who were also driven from the shipyards by the pogroms. So I, I think Millicent made a fundamental mistake in Ireland because it refused to recognise that the working class are not one indivisible whole. They also have divisions and you have to tackle the causes of the, the, those divisions. I'm also not convinced that Ireland cannot be re reunited on a capitalist basis. I've seen no objective reason for that. It would certainly cause convulsions, but certainly South Africa, for instance, got rid of apartheid uh, under capitalism. It doesn't therefore mean it's got rid of the horrific oppression uh, of capitalism in South Africa, but that is a different matter. I mean, it is quite possible in Ireland, but when you have a specific section of the working class which is oppressed because of a certain arbitrary national factor, it's your duty to support them and not to, as Militant did, effectively ally with the political wing of the UVF, the PFP. I, I think that was a mistake uh, instead of uh, supporting the Republicans whilst being critical. I mean, you don't have to be uncritical, but the position Militant took was effectively reactionary and pro-imperialist. Thank you. Yes, interesting points. Um, Ed, feel free to <laughs> reply to as many comments as you can. <laughs> it's certainly been the most vibrant discussion we've had for a while. <laughs> it's, it's, been, it's been a very good discussion and I've, I've listened carefully to what comments are saying. Can, but can you hear me, by the way? Yes, yes. Yeah, well, good. Yeah, yeah. OK, I mean, I've, li I've listened very carefully to what comments are saying and, I, I, you know, I, I think that there's a lot of important points being made. Uh, um, uh, I'm, where to begin? Um, I, well, first of all, I, I too am not an expert on the entire history of Trotskyism. Um, and I was asked to come here tonight to talk about um, the contribution that Ted Grant has made to, um, to socialism. Um, I, I, I've got to say, first of all, um, in, in response to some of the things that Tony has said, um, uh, when I was a young student in university in the early 1970s, I read a copy of Militant for the first time. And more than anything else, it was the position of Militant on Ireland that made me think these people have got a point. Because what I read in that article, I can't remember it word for word, it's so many years ago, but what I read in that article was that the, the task, the fundamental task is to bring about unity of Protestant and Catholic workers in a struggle against the real oppressor who are the capitalists. And I mean, that was one of the things that started getting me interested in militant tendency. Um, so, um, you, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure other comrades have had different experiences and, and read different things, but I, I don't know where this is coming from, that uh, Militant has got such a horrific position 
on on Ireland. I, I mean, all, all I, I I do I do agree with what you know with with some of the things that Harry Hutchison said that the militant has a, a socialist perspective for Ireland, and I, I think if even if you look at it today, with with all the problems created by you know the impending collapse of the Good Friday Agreement and Brexit, and the the kind of tensions that that is creating and the um, dysfunction of the the Northern Ireland government at the moment, it's pretty glaringly obvious that a socialist solution is the solution. Um, the, the, and and that I mean I don't want to say never say never. I don't want to say that capitalism can't find a solution, but you know, Tony Blair's Northern Ireland agreement uh, is falling to bits. And whatever ramshackle agreement that capitalism can organize to replace it would be equally uh, unstable. And, you know, the bringing together of, of the working class by a movement that actually abolishes the idea of the nation can only be achieved by capitalism. So I, 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 I you know, I do think that um, there's a lot to be said for the position that Militant has always put forward on, on Northern Ireland. Um, now, um, I mean, well, I mean, there's been a lot of discussion about the, the, the kind of history of different groups and, and movements in Britain. And what, one of the comrades, um, I think, sort of said he didn't really, really know where, where I stand now. I mean, I, uh, when militant tendencies split, I stayed with the Peter Taff group for a while, but I quickly realized that they had lost their way as well. And um, since then, I've been an independent socialist looking to develop links between socialist movements. I, I do agree with what comrades have said about the, 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 the poll tax campaign. I think the the poll tax, I, 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 I entirely agree. I, I forget which comrade said it. Maybe it was Harry as well, that um, the poll tax campaign, uh, yes, comrades are right. The, 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 the majority of people who participated in that were nothing to do with the Labour Party. But the political catalyst that got this thing going came through the left that was organized in the Labour Party, and it was a it was the downfall of Thatcherism. So I think um, you know there there are um, great lessons to be learned from that. Um, the let, let's say a word or two about what's been what what's been spoken about in regard to to the Jeremy Corbyn movement. I think that the Jerry, Jeremy Corbyn movement did demonstrate at the time that there was perhaps more life in the Labour Party than some of us um, than some of us thought at that time. I certainly rejoined the Labour Party after decades of absence from it when Jeremy Corbyn became leader. Um, and it also showed the the extreme limitations of um, the Labour Party because it showed just how far the left can get within the Labour Party. Now, I don't think any of us have got a crystal ball. None of us know how a socialist party on the left will be built. And there's no doubt that many socialists who are in the Labour Party will play a part. They might have been expelled by then, they might not have, but they will play a part in the formation of a socialist party on the left. Um, and um, I mean, I'm, I'm primarily here to talk about Ted Grant's life. The, the, the idea of entrism into the Labour Party as a way of um, doing 
doing agitational work for socialist revolution, but doing it in a milieu, in an atmosphere where you have access to the most politically thinking workers, workers, the working class um, who are who are engaging in politics. I think it was a brilliant idea, and um, it, it's no no longer applicable um, to to the vast bulk of the Labour Party in Britain any longer. Uh, because I mean, the, the 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 Labour Party is fragmenting as we speak with expulsions and so on, and so. Um, you know, we, we have to be ready to build a new party through the influence of trade unions, who just like the trade unions at the end of the 19th century, they weren't prepared to um, put up with, with a liberal government or some alternative to the Conservatives. And they, they um, set out to form a party of the working class because the workers needed their own representation. And um, we have to also uh, prepare the forces for an independent party of the working class. Now, some of the comrades have made contributions that quite correctly indicate the, the limitations of the parliamentary system. And I, I think that we all have to be aware that, you know, getting somebody like Jeremy Corbyn into 10 Downing Street is not... As, as sadly some some people in the Labour Party have imagined, you know, it's not the end of the problem, it's the beginning of the problem. I mean, let's remember what happened in Chile in, in 1973, you know, where you had a socialist government democratically elected that was overthrown by a CIA coup, that we have to have forms of democracy that are far more deeply rooted in the working class than parliamentary democracy we have to and that's why the russian revolution is so relevant because you know the soviets the workers committees based in every workplace where and like with the paris commune you didn't have to wait five years if you weren't happy with your representative you could recall your representative anytime you wanted and representatives had no higher wage than the average wage of the people that they represent this is the kind of democracy that we need to fight for. And while we have a country that's run with a parliament, if we can get one or two parliamentary representatives to use, to, to use that platform as an advertising post, we're not opposed to it, but I don't think we should have any illusions that the path to socialism is through parliamentary democracy. Um, I, I mean, there, there's there, there's loads of good ideas being raised. I, I I like the idea of getting more people on on the show to talk about you know different aspects of the history of the Fourth International. I mean, I I, I you know I'm, I listen was it was it Terry or Stephen I, I, who, who made the point about the um, the history of the Fourth International? I mean, that there's probably a lot more that we could learn, and other comrades should come in and you know state their experiences of having been involved in, in, in different parts of the Trotskyist movement. But I, you know, I think if I can just sort of su sum, sum up the main um, idea that I came here tonight to, to uh, present. Marxism is a method of analysis that is continually adapting and changing as society changes. You, it's like, um, you know, we're in a war. Nobody goes into a war. I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about the war in Ukraine. I'm talking about a class war. We're in a class war between the working class who need to fight back against exploitation and the ruling class all over the world who are trying to hang on to their right to exploit working class people. And in a war, you need to have a battle plan. But every time there's a movement in a war, you have to revise your battle plan because new situations arise, things don't turn out as you anticipated, and you have to keep adjusting. Now, the, the great strength of Ted Grant was that after the Second World War, when it was manifestly, when it became manifestly clear that 
the fourth international wasn't going to become the dominant force on the planet within a few years, as Trotsky had predicted in 1938. Ted Grant was able to adapt and change and revise the perspective and develop a better understanding of how the movement needs to work to prepare itself for future opportunities. And with that correct perspective, he was able to develop a group that was effective, that did achieve um, some big significant gains in Liverpool um, and, and, and did make an impact on the movement. Uh, the, 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 this is the, the great lesson that we have to strive to learn from. It's not a question, I mean, by, by the way, I never, meant, I never meant to insult anyone in the SWP if I said that, um, I, I, you know, people were, um, people in the Fourth International were, were mouthing um, the, the, the phrases of Trotsky long after they were, um, long after they, they'd become redundant. I mean, it, you know, I, I'm, I'm very happy to learn from comrades in the SWP, as I am from other comrades in in um, in, in different uh, movements. Um, but we do have to continually revise and develop our ideas. And I think that um, Ted probably was not so good at that in the 1980s, and he really lost the plot, um, which is, it's why he ended up like, you know, like a, a lot of good comrades do. He ended up in 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 a, in a small sect that that isn't going anywhere, and um, uh, you know, we we have to adapt to the situation we're in now, which is different from um, 1948, and we we have to be ready to be part of the building of a new mass movement that comes from the grassroots up, that comes from the trade unions, and that has a plurality of ideas. I, I, uh, I, I, I agree with comrades who um, want to turn their back on groups that have a rigid party line, and you have to adhere to that. In order to be a member of that group, it's uh, that those organisations are never going to get the ear of the mass of young workers who want to be involved in debate, who want the 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 the, the excitement and the learning experience of clarifying ideas. We have to be part of a movement like that that will open up in the next period that that um, European society is going into with the with the decline in living standards, the cost of living crisis inflation, the war. I mean, it's a, it's a great phrase of Marx, war is the midwife of revolution. And here I am referring to the war in Ukraine, which is, is causing so much um, um, uh, disruption to the world economy, inflation, uh, um, poverty, um, uh, hunger. And, um, you, you know, the, the, this, it, it, it starts as a, a big bonanza of nationalism and jingoism, but it ends up as the First World War and to some extent also the Second World War very much, it ends up with um, a, an aspiration for something different because we can no, no longer tolerate the kind of conditions we're expected to live under and, uh, and the, the conditions under which we're expected to serve the, the, the ruling class who are trying to run this planet for profit, who are ruining the environment and so on. They, 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 these are great lessons to learn. And um, I hope that the life of Ted Grant, along with the contribution of other people in the movement, can play a part in uh, helping develop our ability to adapt to a new world situation. Thank you, Tina. Thank you very much, comrade. I mean, the Iraq war didn't lead to <laughs> revolution. Uh, you know, it's it's a wishful thinking. I think. I mean, I hope we we you know uh, we hope the working class does rebel against the drive to war, and there will, you know, there is a drive to war against China uh, as well, no doubt. And 
that's how you stop a war. You have to rebel and including in the army, uh, of course. Thank you for your thank you for your um, opening, which is, has has led to a lot of discussion in the chat and and within the uh, comments here. I mean, what is what is interesting, I think, about socialist appeal is they didn't do what militant did when they were expelled from the Labour Party. They didn't say, "Oh, right now the Labour Party has changed its character." That's what I was thought about. Very odd about militant. As soon as they were expelled, it turned from a bourgeois workers party to a bourgeois party so it was kind of there being in the labor party that made it a workers party you know a bourgeois workers party i don't don't think that was always very convincing and socialist peel did, did did well i think in the labor party one of the few groups that grew uh in the corbyn period um so you know they they did and they were relatively comradely etc but still you know they hadn't quite cracked how to build a party and not a sect that's uh, I liked your remarks at the end towards we need to be able to discuss things and debate things and have different viewpoints otherwise you just just build a sect and that's never going to grow past 2000 maybe you know the size of the socialist party of socialist workers party and all these groups have have achieved so we need to really work out how to do something a bit better Thank you very much, Ed. Thank you very much, comrades. Next week, we'll be hearing from uh, a comrade from the United States, Luke Pickrell, who will be introducing Huey Newton. If you want to introduce somebody from our history to this in this session, please get in touch, info at laborleft.org. And I should say, of, of course, everybody who comes on uh, will give their viewpoint about somebody. You know, you can't do it in a neutral way. We're all, you know, active politically. We all have our different views so there will be different interpretations of what people have achieved and what they have written so comrades um you know if if you want to get involved please please email and um yes see you hopefully next week bye bye good night